is God's grace enough for us as we think of Thanksgiving and all that we can be thankful for? We're going to begin our service with this song. You can remain seated for the first song. Great is your faithfulness, O God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. Oh. 
blessings and his provision for us and all that he has, has blessed us with and uh, most significantly we sung of his grace giving us what we don't deserve in life through Jesus Christ and so we have a lot to celebrate and a lot to be thankful for and today we are specifically doing that with our harvest dinner around the tables following the service <coughs> and we would encourage you to stay for dinner following church this morning. If you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. We welcome you, and you're more than welcome to stay for the dinner. We would encourage everybody to be a part so that we can enjoy fellowship around the table and some good food. I think and we have absolute confidence in that. So uh, dinner will be roughly 1230 um, following the service in the fellowship hall. Reminder also and announcements that there's no Awana tomorrow night. Tomorrow is Veterans Day and a school holiday, so there will not be Awana tomorrow evening. A call to worship is Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all nations. Laud him, all people. For his loving kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord is everlasting. Praise the Lord. Let's bow and pray. Father, as we gather together in your house this morning, we are mindful that we do have a tremendous amount to be thankful for. You have blessed us in a myriad of ways, and we see that materially, and we see that physically, and we see that spiritually because of the relationship that we can have with you through Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that we would continually be mindful that all of this comes from your hand. Though we may work hard, though we may be good stewards, we might be diligent, truly our talents come from you, the fruit of our labors come from your blessing, and that ought to motivate us to just bow in worship of you. So as we gather together this morning, I pray that our hearts truly would be worshipful, that we would focus on you, focus on who you are, your goodness to us, and that in everything we would do, we would do it with an act of worship, and an attitude of worship. Father, our desire is that, that we would exalt your name and glorify you, whether it be through song, through the teaching of your word, through giving, through fellowship around the table. May each thing that we do point others to you, be a testimony of our adoration of you, and may you be pleased and honored. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated.
we continue to sing, we consider the fact that the throne of Jesus is the highest throne that we can aspire to and be called to be followers of.
us last week that there was something new going to happen in relationship to men's ministries and we're going to see the video right now. Hey guys, I want to challenge you this Saturday to make an excuse to gather with the men in your life in a coffee shop, in your living room, uh, in your local church, no matter what it is. Make an excuse to invite other men to join you for the experience of the Global Men's Gathering. It's going to be streamed live at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time, no matter where you are. Man, I want you to tune in live with us. Last month, we had 15 countries that tuned in live with us. Be a part of this experience, but most importantly, invite men with you because after there's four discussion questions that you talk through and some guys might need exactly what this message has for them, but most importantly, they need to see and be around Christ in you. So link shields, make sure you make it a priority. I can't wait to be with you this Saturday. I'm a man on a mission. Disregard the date that's on that slide. Um, that was last month's promo video. Um, but anyway, SoulCon is a men's ministry uh, that I've been a part of for about a year now. Um, SoulCon, uh, it's all about advancing the kingdom of God and calling up brothers in Christ. If we're going to be, as SoulCon calls it, a soldier for Christ, we need to be, um, sorry. We need to be open and honest with each other, and most importantly, ourselves. The Global Men's Gathering is the opportunity and material to do just that. It's relevant and intense, but if you want the radical faith that Christ calls us all to, you can't get that with a sugar-coated, two-faced lifestyle. The GMG is a monthly live broadcast. However, we're going to be streaming it on the following Sunday. We're going to meet in the SOS room downstairs at 9 a.m. next Sunday, and then every third Sunday of the month to follow. Since we will be limited on time for uh, in-depth discussion, my intention, God willing, is that the material presented by SoulCon will be taken home, 
so that you can apply it to your life and then grind it over for the next few weeks and then use it in the next Men on a Mission meeting that meets after service on the first Sunday of each month. So if you can't make it to these Men on a Mission meetings, I still encourage you to come to this monthly morning session of Global Men's Gathering. SOULCON and GMG isn't geared towards teenagers, it isn't geared towards adults, and it isn't geared towards the senior generation. It's geared towards men of God in all walks and stages of life who desire to advance the kingdom of God by boldly living out their faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that you will be challenged and uplifted in this time together. Make an excuse to be here next Sunday at 9 a.m. Thank you. There are many resources available to us, and I encourage you to take part of those things. In our series of messages that we began last week on salvation, we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. I invite you to turn your Bibles to that. I invite you to stand with us. And in Genesis 3, 1 through 7, we are going to see why we so desperately need the help and the grace of God. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Uh, someone in our family fellowship last night, we were dealing with this passage of scripture, the entire chapter 3 of Genesis, and they said they felt very depressed by Genesis chapter 3 and the circumstances of what happens there. That was the feeling they walked away from. We're going to sing a song that says the opposite of that. It says, how great are you, Lord? And I want you to think the greatness of God as presented in Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 7. How great are you, Lord? How great is your mercy? How great are the things that you have done for me? How great are you, Lord? Your loving kindness is filling my heart. Thank you. 
can get going here. Um, what's the, what do you think was the best part about living in the Garden of Eden? Best part about living in the Garden of Eden? Nothing comes to mind? What? Everything was perfect, okay. So as you walked through barefoot, you didn't stub your toe, you didn't step on a, on a thorn, you didn't, uh, okay, didn't have anything like that. Anything else? Best thing about Garden of Eden? Lots of food. Free food, great variety, pick it when you're hungry, move on, everything's perfect, so you're not going to get fat. You know, you're always going to be healthy, you're always going to enjoy it. I mean, you know, anything else about the garden? I mean, when you get past food, what? Walk with God. The, the, the Bible seems to give this picture that we walk with God. I mean, that's got to be, we don't know what that's like, right? Because we're on the other side of Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and we're kind of in trouble. Next week, we'll deal with what it really means to be in trouble. But So there's some great things. So here's a, here's a question for you. How many choices is too many? How many choices is too many? Well, how, what's the, you got a number? Enough to overwhelm you. You got a number? Ah, it's good. It's different for every person in every situation, right? For some people, two might be too many choices, right? My mother always said there was two choices at dinner time. Do you know what they were? Take it or leave it. Take it or leave it. <laughs> it's two choices. You always have two choices. Take it or leave it. Here, here, let me give you this. So you have 30 minutes to watch television before dinner. Your mother, you don't normally get to watch television. You get 30 minutes. How many choices do you want? How many television choices do you want? You got 30 minutes. You want one? Do you want to have satellite TV with 400 choices? You know, I was at I was at some I was at this this Airbnb with Vicky, you know, a month or so ago, and they had satellite TV, and I'm try and they had no they had no um like guide, and I'm trying to find home and garden television. It was station 256, and I started at station 423, so I had to go into the 600s to get it to cycle to the ones, to get to the it was like 40 minutes to get to the program I wanted. And sometimes two choice, choices are too many, right? Here's another one. There are 42 flavors of ice cream. Which one do you choose? What's that? You don't need ice cream. 42 flavors of ice cream. Which one are you choosing? You would choose vanilla? Is that what you were going to say? You would take chocolate? What might your choice be based on? How might your choice change? You have 42 flavors of ice cream. How might your choice change? Well, I mean, obviously, you're going to, I'm going to choose the ice cream that tastes the worst. So you go up to the little counter and you say, give me the ice cream that is the one that nobody likes. Because I know you have a lot of it and you can't sell it. You know. um, doesn't it matter what toppings maybe? Unless you're going to get a sundae. You're going to get a sundae and you're going to have strawberry topping. Is that going to make a difference what ice cream you choose? I think it does. I think it makes a difference what you choose. You might not want some really weird flavored like cotton candy and yeah, I know. A birthday cake. Um, you know, lemon sherbet with pineapples on it. You wouldn't do that? I don't know, but it's a topping and it's an ice cream. So see, sometime choices. So so for this morning's message, we're going to jump right into it here in a moment. I'll let you go back to your families. Is Adam and Eve have a choice in front of them. They have a couple of choices. And uh, why would a person, I want you to think about this, why might a person choose the bad choice? Think about that as we cover this morning's message, okay? Why might we choose the bad choice? You can have a seat with your families. I was going to give you a bunch of choices today to pick from, but I thought, you know what? There's going to be choices downstairs. You can take it or leave it with dinner. <laughs> uh, unlike a typical, you know, potluck dinner where there's 1,400 choices, today's meal is simply a Thanksgiving dinner, and I hope you'll stay and you'll enjoy it with us. We'll have a little bit of a devotional down there. There won't be any evening service here tonight, but we're looking forward to that. In this study of the, 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 the teaching on salvation in the Bible, we're looking at what it means to be in the image of God. Um, we've been made in God's image. According to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Well, what does that mean? Last week, we communicated three things. First, that being in the image of God, we can communicate 
We can talk to one another, and we can talk to God, and we can hear from God. That's part of being in the image of God. The second thing we talked about last week is that we can commune. I looked up a couple of quotes of John Muir. You are familiar with John Muir? He's the naturalist, late 1800s. He went out and explored the, the West particularly. He fell in love with what became Yosemite National Park, Yosemite Valley. Here's two things he said about enjoying the environment in which we live. He said, in every walk with nature, one receives far more than he seeks. John Muir felt that any time he went out into nature, he got more than what he actually went out to get. He was overwhelmed by nature. Here's another thing John Muir said. Now, he's a naturalist. There's no indication that, that he was worshiping God necessarily, but he said this. The clearest way into the universe is through a forest wilderness. He felt in walking through the wilderness God created, he could touch and understand and appreciate the greater universe. God gave us this ability to appreciate, right, everything that's around us. He gave us the ability to enjoy peace. I don't know if animals enjoy peace. I don't know if they appreciate what's around them. I know they don't communicate in the sense that we do. Animals don't write down a history. They don't record in a journal their experiences and then relive them. This last week, I was, I was scrolling through some of the digital pictures I've taken over the last couple of years and just kind of reliving the experiences of the places I've been. The third thing that God gives us when he made us in his image is this idea that we can cohabit. We are not alone in the world. He made us both to partner with other humans, particularly in the male and female relationship, but also to cohabit with him, to enjoy. One of the things one of the kids said here this morning about the Garden of Eden was it was a place you could walk with God. There was a relationship that was offered that is uniquely different. Well, if all of that is available to us, what could we possibly want that's more? Consider this verse, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9. Genesis 2 and verse 9. God wanted us to conceive more than the things I've already mentioned. He said, and out of the ground the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God wanted more for us than just life. He put the tree of life. He gave us all of the things that were pleasant to see and eat. Then he gave us the tree of life that would enable us to live and live and live and live. And then he made another tree as well. Because God wanted for us more than living. Sometimes we just live, right? And, and, and we just exist. And we just go day to day, and sometimes we get caught in that. And God says, there is more. Here's the profound thing that we find in Genesis 3. God wanted us to know good and evil. You might say, whoa, 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 whoa. That's, that can't be true. That can't be true that God wanted us to know good and evil. Because you read the end of the chapter 3, and you see all the problems that came out of it. And that was the accurate statement made in our family fellowship last night, that, that you read chapter 3 of Genesis and you feel like kind of down. It is true. There is enmity. There is destruction. There is death. There is, there is pain. There is suffering. You, those words are all there. And we'll talk about them more next week. But God wanted us to know good and evil. What does that mean? God wanted us to know all that he is and all that he isn't. Do you really think God made a tree whose fruit would miraculously give you all of the knowledge of good and evil? See, do we think that is what the tree was that he put in the garden? That once you ate that fruit, it somehow miraculously gave you all the knowledge about good and evil. Do we really think that's what's happening? Was it an encyclopedia of darkness and light? If it wasn't, then why did God create it? Why did he plant the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and why did he put it right where Adam and Eve could see it? Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now the serpent correctly points out that God lets us choose. God lets us choose. This is what the serpent is saying in verse 1. 
Is it true that God said you could eat of every tree? Is it true you get to choose? It is. It is true. God lets us choose. Part of being in the image of God is that God lets us choose. Now, there was a tree, right? And there was a prohibition. You go back to chapter 2, and God says, don't eat of the tree I put in the middle of the garden. Don't eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat it. It's a prohibition. There's one rule. All we hear about Adam and Eve is that there's one rule in their life. They got all the trees to eat from. They got the tree of life to extend their life, to enjoy all these experiences. But there's one rule. There's one line. There's one line between light and darkness. There's one line between good and evil. There's one line between obedience and disobedience. The struggle we have in our culture right now is we don't have any lines, right? The lines are being pulled away, and you don't know what. Everything's kind of like, uh, it's good if you think it's good. It's bad if you think it's bad, but don't judge me if you think what I'm doing is bad. You know, God said there's one line. And he says, I'd appreciate it if you stayed on this side. One rule. The choice that is in front of Adam and Eve. The choice. The tree sits there. The choice is the knowledge of good and evil. The choice is the knowledge of good and evil. See, Adam and Eve didn't have to eat the fruit to gain the knowledge of good and evil. They didn't have to eat the fruit to gain the knowledge. They only had to recognize the choice. There's a choice to make. The choice is the knowledge of good and evil. It's not the tree. It's not the fruit. They could choose good, or they could choose evil, right? As they looked at the tree, as they're confronted with the tree, as God draws the line from the tree... They have a choice to make. They can choose good or they can choose evil. They can choose to obey. They can choose to disobey. They can choose to eat or they can choose to not eat. That is the knowledge. Verses 2 and 3 says this of Genesis. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor... Shall you touch it lest you die? In this verse, we find God letting us question. Eve questions God. God lets us question him. Not only does he let us choose, he allows us to question him. Is that what God said? And she goes, well... What are we not allowed to do? Well, there's a line, but what else is included in the line? So, so Eve surmises there's a line, but there's more included in the line than just the line, don't eat. We probably shouldn't touch. So she questions God's instructions. Is it that simple? Is the instruction to not eat the fruit, is, is, is really that all there is to this? Or is there more to this? Sometimes we question what's going on around us. What will happen if we disobey? What happens Even Adam are looking at that fruit? Well, what will really happen? He says we're going to die, but what does that mean? What will really happen? Are there different penalties? Are there levels of disobedience? If we only nibble at the fruit, what if we taste the fruit and we spit it out? What if we don't swallow the fruit? There, there's, there's, there's different degrees. What, what about mitigating factors? Later, when we get into the next passage of Scripture, and uh, Eve is confronted by what she's done, does she take the full blame? She points at the serpent. When Adam is confronted by God, does he take the full blame? Or are there mitigating circumstances? Well, you know, God, the problem is not me eating the fruit. The problem is you, because you gave me the woman. And you can see what she's like. How would I say no? It's really not my fault. So in the questioning that Eve presents, 
She doesn't present the question to us in verses 2 and 3. She presents the answer to the question that she's already said. Well, God says don't eat it, but I think we should expand that to let's not touch it as well. And God lets her do that. He lets her question. He lets Satan question. Now, can we take back when we cross the line? Well, I know I crossed the line, but I want to mulligan. I want to do over. I want to take that back. You can't take it back. When we sin, you can't take it back. It's over. It's done. It's happened. And yet in this questioning, we wonder, well, can I really get away with something more? Look at verses 4 and 5 of Genesis 3. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. She questions, and he gives her an answer. You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat, of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He says, no, the whole knowing of good and evil is wrapped up in the fruit. When God allows us to question him, how far does he let us go? Are we allowed to question the content of what God says? The content. Die? Really, God, are we going to die? Well, what does die really mean? We were talking about that last night in our family fellowship. As, as what does die mean? Is all death the same? We question the content. Sometimes you'll read parts of the Bible and you go, eh, really? Red Sea crossing, dry land, ocean of water, eh, probably low tide, small section, low tide, and a big sandbar. Probably what it was. We sometimes question the content. Sometimes we question the source. Did God really say that? Are you, are you really telling me this is what God said? Or did someone make that up? Have you ever heard something, quote, from the Bible, and you wonder if it was actually from the Bible, and you found out it was Ben Franklin? A penny wise, a penny saved is a penny earned. That's in the Bible, right? No, I think it was Ben Franklin who said that. Sometimes we get these amazing quotes we read, and we go, is that from the Bible? Well, if there's not a reference there, and you can look it up, it's probably not from the Bible. And sometimes we question the source. You know, Pastor, what are you saying? Is that really from the Bible? Or is that just something you've thought up? Are we allowed to question the source? Are we allowed to question the content? Are we allowed to question the motive? You know, this whole fruit thing, this whole knowledge of good and evil. God, are you holding back? You said you made us in our image, but are you holding back a little bit for yourself? I mean, if we're going to be truly like you, shouldn't we get to be like you? Shouldn't we get to know good and evil? I mean, why not let us know this stuff? I mean, you know, in our world today, we got to make sure everybody from the age of like eight months knows everything, right? Got to make sure everybody knows everything. Give them all the information as early as possible because people deserve to know everything. Would you like to know everything that our government knows about our security? Do you want to know that? I mean, do you, you want to know how many terrorist attacks have been thwarted? I mean, do you want to know that? You'd probably never leave your house. Well, maybe in upstate New York we would, but certainly not if we were in a major city. You wouldn't want to know the stuff, right? But the question is, God, I think you're holding back. There's all this knowledge. You put this tree here that somehow possesses all this miraculous knowledge, and you're holding back. I don't get a chance to have it and experience it. How am I going to make a good choice if I don't know? You ever heard a person say, how will I know I don't want to do something until I've tried it? You know, how do I know I don't want to smoke? Let me smoke some cigarettes for 20 years, and then I'll decide whether I don't want to smoke. You know, I, I, I don't know what alcohol's like. Let me drink some alcohol, and then I'll decide whether or not I shouldn't drink and drive. I mean, please, we should have an opportunity to experience things so that we know whether we want to do them or not, right? And I'll tell you what we could do. This happened yesterday at a restaurant. I was with the re at a restaurant with my wife and my mother. And my mother had never eaten a lime. And we ordered this dish that had a couple of limes on the plate. And she'd never eaten a lime. And so she says, what's a lime taste like? And I said, try it. <laughs> it was a terrible experience for her. It was a wonderful experience for Vicki and I. She popped that lime in her mouth and went, oh, oh, this is terrible. She says, well, it's not like a lemon. <laughs> you know, sometimes we want to walk through life that way. Well, you know what? I got to know how bad something is, so let me do it. And this is what's in front of Adam and Eve. You're holding back, God. If he really made us in his image, then why can't we really be like God? Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. 
So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and that it was desirable to make one wise, we're not going to go into those three characteristics. We're going to go into what she does. It doesn't matter the reason why, necessarily at this junction, why she takes the fruit. But she took the fruit and ate it. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate it. God lets us sin. He not only gives us a choice and allows us to question him, he lets us choose poorly. He lets us sin. So when we sang the song, I've already forgotten what it was. Let me look at my list here. Oh, how great are you, Lord? I want to get the title right. We sang the song, How Great Are You, Lord, out of Genesis 3, 1 through 7. It seems to be a conundrum. Here's man doing all this wicked stuff, and we're saying how great God is. God is so great that he made us in his image that he allows us to choose, question, and sin. That's how great he is. And if you listen to and follow some of the words in that song, it says, great is his mercy toward us. In that moment, as Adam and Eve looked at the tree and its fruit, stay with me on this. In that moment, when they looked at the tree and ate its fruit, they already knew good and evil. They already knew good and evil. Here's where we often get hung up. It wasn't the tree. It wasn't the fruit that possessed the good and evil. They already knew it. They were created with the knowledge of good and evil. God gave it to them from the start. We are made in God's image. God knows good and evil. And he gave us the same knowledge. Let me walk this through for you. God said no. He doesn't need a reason. And he doesn't have to explain his thinking when he said, don't eat the tree. Don't eat the fruit. He said no. He doesn't have to explain why. He doesn't have to give them any kind of a reason. God's no is good. That is the definition of good. God puts a tree in front of them and says, don't eat the fruit. This is good. Don't eat it. You want to know what good is? Don't eat the fruit. That's good. For Adam and Eve to listen to God, to understand his prohibition, and to obey it is to know good. As the tree sits in front of them and God says, don't eat the fruit, as they hear those words, as they understand what God is saying, and then they choose to obey him, they are now knowing good. Every moment they didn't go to the tree, didn't take the fruit, didn't eat it, they are knowing good. They're experiencing good. They know full well what it is. Because God gave them a definition. Here's good. Don't eat the fruit. You want to know what good is? Don't eat the fruit. Don't eat the fruit. Don't eat the fruit. 3,000 choices of fruit surrounding you. Have anything you want. Don't eat the fruit. That's what's good. Don't eat the fruit. I could have said to my mother yesterday, trust me, don't taste the lime. <laughs> don't taste the lime. You're not going to like it. And then we got talking about how grandparents give babies lemons to see their face curl. <laughs> we had this whole conversation. And, and, and my, mother was, my mother was telling us about how she did it to all of her grandchildren on my brother's side, but never did it to my children because she wasn't with them when they were that young. And she says, every one of his kids, when they were like three months old, she'd stick a lemon in their mouth and watch their face all make faces. I'm going, what kind of mother are you? <laughs> she says, well, I didn't get the chance to do it to your kids. <laughs> so I did it to your brother's kids because I saw them. To know good is to experience good is to fully embrace good. Every day they didn't take of the fruit, they were experiencing fully what it meant to have the knowledge of good. They had a free choice in front of them. They could experience good. They could choose to experience evil. 
they knew enough to it to make their choice. They could, and if you went to that verse in verse 6, they could easily explain why they made their choice, right? Well, you were holding back. Well, it really was good to look at. Yeah, it would make me smarter than I am now. I need to know more. They could easily explain their choice away. Later, when they get caught, they explain it differently. They, they explain their reasoning. They, they, they blame others rather than explain why they took the fruit. But they had their reasons. They knew enough to make their choice. See, here's another phrase I want you to say. It'll come on the screen. It wasn't the tree that possessed the knowledge of good and evil. It was the heart and mind of man. God created the heart and mind of man to already possess the knowledge of good and evil. If they did not possess the knowledge, the prohibition would have made no sense. If they didn't know they could choose, then why tell them don't? If an infant doesn't understand language, then giving them a prohibition doesn't make any sense. But how quickly does a kid understand the word no? I mean, how young are children when you teach them no? It's pretty early. Maybe it's the tone of your voice. Maybe it's the flaring nostrils. Maybe it's the red face. Whatever it is you're doing to this poor little four-week-old. And the mother's saying to that little baby, no, no, no. How is it they pick it up? Because they already possess the knowledge of good and evil. And I'm not saying they got it because of Adam. Yes, Adam inherited all this, but he made us this way. Adam and Eve can look at that tree and go, yeah, we know what good is and we know what evil is. Good is we don't take the fruit. Evil is we take the fruit. We know what it is, but we want more knowledge of good and evil. There's got to be something more. There's got to be more. There's got to be more things we could pursue. We want to know more. You know, you don't have to get drunk to know that drunkenness is probably not a good situation. To lose control, to not know what's going on, to forget what happened. You could probably, with uh, having heard stories, you could probably go, you know, I don't really need to be drunk in order to know drunkenness isn't probably very good. So, so you don't have to actually experience it to know the good and evil. And that's what's happening here. Good and evil is already there. The choice was there. God put the tree in the garden to test their heart. So before we blame God, because I don't want to blame God here, because you might say, oh, so, so God is, it's God's fault they're sin. It's God's fault. He gave them a choice. He gave them the opportunity to question, and he allowed them to sin. So it's God's fault they sin, because he put it in front of them. James chapter 1, verse 13 says this. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. There are several important things in this verse that James gives us. Remember, James is the half-brother of Jesus. If there was anybody who understood what it meant to have somebody in your life who never did evil, who never sinned, do you suppose James was a bit torqued by his older brother, Jesus? Imagine living in the household where your older brother— all of us hate the oldest child, right, unless you are the oldest child— Anybody who's not the oldest child hates the oldest child. For somehow the oldest child is just superior. The oldest child always did things before everybody else. The oldest child is the smartest. The oldest child is the, is the favorite of the family. I'm not, I'm not saying this like it's actually real, but it is more real than it's not real, okay? So if you're an oldest child, I apologize for painting the picture that you're a terrible person. But for the rest of us who aren't the oldest child, we know you're a terrible person. Okay. That's all to say Jesus was the oldest child, and he was the superior one in the family over mom and dad. So here's what James writes. Having come to faith in his brother, Jesus, having grown in his faith and writing to the young believers of the, of the Jewish nation, he's saying, don't you dare say that God sins, is ever tempted to sin, and causes us to sin. It's not his fault. First, because God will never choose evil. God knows evil, and he's never tempted by it. He never chooses it. He never thinks twice about doing it. 
He doesn't justify it. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't give a reason for it. He just understands evil, knows what it is, and says, I don't do that. We could probably, all of us, find something in our lives, some evil out there, that for us, we would never do it. It's, just, it's, it's not a temptation to us. For whatever reason, that evil, we wouldn't do. A curse word would not come out of our mouths. Uh, you know, there's something. For each of us, there's something like that. For God, it's everything. It doesn't matter what it is. He's not going to do it. And he made us in his image. What does that mean? We don't have to sin. We don't have to give in to the temptation. We don't have to think about it. We could actually experience good while knowing we didn't know evil. Let me say that again. We could experience good without ever having to experience evil evil you can actually walk through life not doing certain sins we could but every time we do them we make a choice we make a choice to let our frustration get to us and allow us to lose control we 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 make a conscious choice to i deserve this we make our our reasons we make our excuses but we actually in the image of god we can recognize what is good and what is evil and we can choose to do good and we could choose to do good every single time. We won't, but hopefully we do it more often good than we fall into certain sins. James chapter 1, verse 14 says this. Here's how he concludes it. But each one of us is tempted when we're drawn away by our own desires and enticed. God did not hold back when he made us. He actually didn't hold back. So the excuse of Adam and Eve, well, we need to have the tree because we don't have a full knowledge of good and evil. Here's what God is saying. I didn't hold back when I made you. You had a full understanding of good and evil. It was whatever I said. That was good and evil. And it only said one thing. It only gave you one thing. You want to know what good and evil was? I gave you the one thing that was good and evil. Now, would I expand that over time? Yes. We don't give all the rules to our children when they're a toddler. We wait on some of those rules till they become 9 and 10 and 13 and 15. And then time we give other instructions when they become adults. And maybe you're asking for advice and someone gives you some more rules, some more understanding. But God says, I gave you the rule. You understood it. I didn't hold back. Here's the final statement I want you to see. The tree in the garden was not the missing piece in our creation. God put the knowledge of good and evil in us when he made us. The tree was simply the test. It was just a test. Would we choose God? Would we choose good? Or would we choose ourselves? Would we choose evil? Do we not face that same choice every day? Multiple times a day. Are we going to choose God? Or are we going to choose ourselves? See, the hard part is, because God made us in our his image, there's a part of us that thinks, I'm God. Therefore, I get to make the rules. Therefore, I get to define my own behavior. Therefore, nobody gets to question me. And next week, when you read verses 8, 9, 10, and following of Genesis chapter 3, you find out that thinking you're God, thinking you get to make the rules, definitely has consequences. And the term death, if you eat of the fruit, you will surely die, is a much better bigger concept that plagues us than the last breath you take or the tragic end of life in some horrendous accident or or act of violence it is the living breathing struggle that we pay a price for because we're just like Adam and Eve We have the knowledge of good and evil, and we often choose evil over good. Dear Father, as we seek 
to follow you. Help us recognize the particular areas in our own life where we consistently fail you, consistently choose against you, consistently choose ourselves, and explain away or care little for the consequences. Help us to understand that your goodness gave us the opportunity to have a relationship with you for which you did not hold back our understanding of the world around us and ourselves. You allowed us to see you and to question what we're seeing and then gave us the opportunity to choose you. And as a result of these choices we make day to day, year to year, you still love us. You still forgive us. You still demonstrate and extend your mercy to us in ways that is certainly undeserved and we are unable to fully appreciate. Help us, Lord, to sing praises to you out of a heart of thanksgiving so that we recognize through our words and hopefully a demonstration of our mind and heart that you alone are worthy of all glory, all honor, and all praise. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who paid the price, the ultimate price, to reestablish the opportunity for us to know you. We pray in his name. Amen. <laughs> Set me your name.